And without further ado, um, our speaker tonight is, is Stephen Lott. He is um, a, a very storied developer in, in, in the, the history of computer science, and um, uh, we're absolutely stoked to have him. Uh, I'll let him uh, introduce himself and talk a little bit more about um, himself before he digs into the topic. Stephen, go ahead. It, it is a to talk this sort of the, the presence of COBOL and so uh, COBOL application. Um, I in software since seventies when computer large, expensive, and rare. So I remember the days there, and so when pe people say, "Oh gosh, this COBOL code, what a load of wait!" I'm I take that. To call that code, and it's not a great jump. So do uh, if my screen share all start here, which it should. Eight by eight is um, a little slow-ish, but. All right, one more try here to see if the uh, my sharing will all work out well. We have the problem of, um, there we are, slowish network because I'm in uh, physically in Nevada and uh, I live not close enough to civilization sometimes uh, to have all the services I would like to have the way people, when I used to live in like why All right, I think we I think we lost Stephen. Um, we'll give him a moment to uh, come back online. It looks like his connection went. As a, a term that I've I've learned recently, uh, it went potato. So we'll give him just a moment to come back. Sorry about the interruption, folks. And now I believe I might be unmuted. Yes, you should be Yay. unmuted. Yay. And then I got to, and now I believe my sharing is slowly taking place. The audio definitely sounds a lot better now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not that's quite um, sure what happened, but it seems to be a lot better now. Yeah, that now we are seeing what I want to see, and so I can do this, and we should have um, nice slides in the background and audio that works, and um, we have swamped somebody's network like nobody's business. But what this is the the what I want to talk about is what is the real underlying problem with having um, tons of legacy software in COBOL. And in particular, I want to talk about how COBOL code, in spite of its bad reputation, is technically an asset, although some people might argue that it is as much liability as it is asset. And then a couple of reasons why fixing COBOL code is kind of hard. And then the real emphasis, which is as modern developers of modern software, what do we do when we bump into 
the legacy applications. And this is near and dear to my heart because I work for a bank, a big bank, Capital One. You, may, you might have our credit card or something. And so Capital One as a big bank up until a few months ago had a basement full of mainframes which meant we had a basement full of COBOL code. We've gotten rid of most of the mainframes. They're now off premises and we are weaning ourselves from the COBOL code as quickly as we can um, because COBOL in the cloud is still COBOL. And we, we basically just have to completely get rid of it. And we've gotten rid of just about all of it as far as I know, except for a few um, things inside uh, the bowels of how customer accounts are, are processed. So. I want to talk about the problem, and I've got my my uh, supplemental visual aid here. This is a picture of um, part of my boat. I used to live on a boat, and this is part of the um, uh, uh, inverter system that transforms boat DC power into AC power, and you can see that there was a bit of a technical problem in this part um, since fixed, but I love that picture of things that are broken. So the trick is that the overall big picture view of COBOL, it's not that COBOL, the language is really bad. It's bad, but a bad language isn't really the root problem that we're all dealing with. It is not really that COBOL skills are vanishingly rare. They are rare, don't make any mistake about that, but um, they're also um, haven't left the earth completely. There are things we can do about the COBOL skill problem. And uh, one of the things that IBM is offering is like free training. So if you don't know COBOL, but think you wanna make some money by um, rescuing people that are stuck with COBOL and don't have the human talent to deal with it, that's that's a solvable part of the problem that that we can we can build COBOL skills. That's not hard. Hey the Stephen, problem, can I interrupt you for a second? You're, yeah, you're, fire away. We're still seeing your first slide. My this, slides are share. not advancing. Yeah. No, unfortunately. Let's um, maybe see. maybe uh, restart restart the share. Uh, oh there no! We go. Now now we have moved forward. That's good. yes. I you know I may actually leave it like this in not present mode. Um, I don't like seeing the, the list of slides down the left side, but what the heck, you know, we'll stick with it. And I'll, I'll go back to the picture, this one picture that I had mentioned uh, of the uh, wiring problem on my boat, um, just because I think it's a, a cool picture. This is the problem exactly. There is something wrong. You can see something wrong in this picture and it is very localized. And so this is the, the issue with COBOL also. There is a problem, it tends to be localized. Uh, so. The real problem here is um, what I like to call uh, management intransigence, the keep the lights on KTLO philosophy that all we're really doing here is keeping the lights on. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And keeping the lights on basically means everything is tech debt and we are going to petrify that tech debt uh, fiberglass it over and preserve it forever because somehow or other we're embracing tech debt as if it is an asset. And this keep the lights on management is in some cases rewarded. People don't hate it. And I'm not exactly sure why they don't hate it. They kind of should, but um, oh well, as far as I can tell, uh, there it is, big as life, and we sort of always have to live with it. Uh, that we're going to have obsolete technology and people are going to be justifying keeping it around because, well, uh, my real job is to uh, keep the lights on, not fix the problems. So when we think about the COBOL asset, I've got some software, it's doing useful things, therefore it's technically an asset because it's still doing useful things. The question is, where is the value and how do I make sure I understand that value? And so what I want to lift up is this guiding principle on understanding the value of software. Software captures knowledge. The whole reason we write software is to capture knowledge and put it in a form that a dumb piece of silicon 
can process that knowledge in a useful and interesting way. Software captures knowledge. So any programming language, you know, COBOL, Python, whatever, is technically Turing complete. And so technically there is a some kind of mapping from COBOL to Python, but God save you from doing anything useful without thinking deeply about what knowledge you have, how you captured it, what you're going to do with it, uh, who needs it, why they need it. They're, all these sort of contextual things are almost as important as the sort of raw knowledge embedded in the code. So what happens here is that COBOL is a very, 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 as a writer, I'm not supposed to use very, but as a speaker, I can say very, very, very simple language. Saddled with some obscure and really unpleasant, difficult to live with features. The simplicity of COBOL was considered once upon a time a, a strength. Uh, nowadays, we're sort of thinking of it as a, a liability. And one of the consequences of having written COBOL 30 years ago is the evolution of the mainframe. Mainframes were just kind of arriving 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, a mainframe was, you know, physically gigantic. It was a room full of refrigerator sized boxes with raised floors and special air conditioning on and on and on. Um, and we, you know, physically they were gigantic. But my note here is that the 370 158, one of the machines that was an early thing that I wrote COBOL for, the peak configuration from International Business Machines, Inc. was four megabytes of RAM. Now, back in the day, we used to m just goggle. Our brains were like a megabyte. That's a thousand kilobytes. Oh my God, 4,000 kilobytes. Holy cow, that's done. Come on, my watch is bigger than that. And generally less than a 24-bit address space. It was like 22 bits plus two bits of flags and crap like that. I mean, we're really talking a tiny, slow, difficult to live with machine. That's what COBOL was written for. Nowadays, IBM has mainframes that are magnificent beasts of processing capability with, you know, hundreds of LPARs and thousands of cores and terabytes of memory and on and on and on. That's not what these programs were written for. These programs were written for the 370, 158. Four mega RAM was maxed out. Few people could afford that back in the day. So what happens is what we think of nowadays as an app was really a system, a collection of individual programs. And I have a note here that it's collections of hundreds of of individual programs. If you do an assay or a, a survey of legacy code bases, you will be hard pressed to be sure you have found all of them and you will be still finding them after you've found the first four or 500. It's really an amazing collection of stuff, each one of which is tiny, a few hundred lines of code, maybe a thousand sometimes, um, 2000 for extraordinarily big ones. I have Python modules of 2,000 lines of code nowadays. They don't even blink at it. But COBOL-wise, you know, that 2,000 lines of COBOL code, that maxed out that processor. That really hurt. So your hundreds of individual programs, they followed a really repeatable design pattern. All of COBOL application world is going to follow this edit update report design patterns or edit programs that validate input transactions and don't do very much else. Update programs do complicated match merge logic to, to take transactions and put them into master files. Um, if they had databases, that was a wonderful thing. But there's COBOL code that does not work with databases. It works with files, um, sorted files. And, you know, report writing, you can guess what that is. So what's important here is that when we look at an edit program, you know, it's going to read some source records. It's going to check some ranges of values and data types. It's kind of looking for some consistency things. It's going to move valid transactions or a batch of valid transactions. And it's going to put in valid transactions somewhere else. So you can imagine that this is not really a lot of sophisticated programming. Um, in 
Python terminology, a batch edit is essentially this. I'm going to open a couple of files, for one for input, a couple of output. I'm going to read it a batch of records. If the batch is valid, I'm going to write it. Or if the batch is invalid, I'm going to write it somewhere else. That is essentially what it is. The problem is that just this overhead would be dozens of lines of COBOL. Not hundreds, but um, you got to think a, a line of Python code is going to multiply out to uh, two or three lines of COBOL in some cases and half a dozen in other cases. And this valid function, which in Python world is, you, you can imagine being like a function, in COBOL would be, you know, logic scattered throughout the stream of statements and it would not be tidy like this. So I labeled this function with the phrase murky at best because it would often be, you know, somewhere between murky and utterly opaque. The updates, uh, a sorted set of transactions, a sorted master file, and this add change delete algorithm and things like that. Um, what it winds up looking like in kind of Python terminology is that we're going to read some records from one file and read some records from another file, and we're going to compare the keys. And whoever's got the lowest value key gets written out next. So if the master is less, write that. If the transaction is less, write that. And if the keys match, then we're going to apply the transaction to update the master record. And again, Murky at best on that update because the updating operation, you know, those actual statements that actually touch the fields of the master record, they could be anywhere in this while loop. There's no reason why it all has to be focused in one function. And therein is the crux of the problem with COBOL is that it was not neatly designed for this kind of maintenance. Uh, like I say, it's the keep the lights on problem that the programs were all small-ish. They had a common template. There were lots of them, but among hundreds of programs, there may be a dozen that update the master files that apply transactions to customer records or apply transactions to shipping records or apply transactions to inventory records, uh, apply transactions to the general ledger. There isn't that many things that need to be updated. There may be lots of edits going in and there may be weird file transfers and there may be filtering and sorting and trash like that. And there will be hundreds of report writing programs, uh, half or more of the uh, the portfolio of application programs will be just report writers to display stuff in a useful form because, because this is important. I'm old enough to remember when the spreadsheet was invented and this stuff was written before the spreadsheet was invented. All y'all are young, so you don't remember these days, but I remember these days before there was a spreadsheet and before there was a word processor. And let me tell you, we did stupid things because we didn't have spreadsheets. And what we did was we wrote lots and lots of COBOL programs that produced similar output because we couldn't just drop a spreadsheet on an accountant's desk so they could fool with it. Instead, we had to write a report. Oh, change these columns around. Oh, change this heading. Oh, add this date calculation. Hundreds of those things, hundreds of them to do stuff that nowadays, it's just a spreadsheet. Just give me a CSV file and get out of the way. So the real root cause, keep the lights on problem here is that in order to keep the budget down, so that we are just keeping the lights on, we are going to do some really dumb optimizations. And this is a gnarly piece of boat hardware, and you can see that it's got tons of hose clamps on it and whatnot. Does it really need all those hose clamps, or is this just some dumb workaround? So, recapitulation, your IBM 370158, the golden machine. Oh my God, we loved the idea of having these. Uh, there was a uh, smaller numbered ones. The 130s and the 120 series were tiny machines. We hated them, but the 158, that was the one. Um, the problem is with so little memory and relatively slow IO, all things considered, uh, you really needed to do lots of clever, clever caching. And, and 
COBOL has no associative store of any kind. Your basic Python dictionary, nope, does not exist. COBOL has arrays, it has, uh, and they work, but I mentioned it barely has arrays because they are all things considered pretty, pretty primitive. And the best part about COBOL arrays, the level best part about them is fixed allocation. You picked a size at compile time and you own that size. If the actual data was bigger than the compiled size, you recompiled your program with a bigger size. What a maintenance nightmare burden that was. So here's what, and I've got at the top of the slide here, um, a type hint. It's a list of tuples, and the two elements of the tuple are strings. And I have to use a list of tuples of two strings because I don't even have a dictionary that will map a string to a string. So I wind up with this huge pile of COBOL stuff in the working storage section. I've got some table, and i got some slots used, and i got a record, and i got a key, and a value, and oh my god, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of code to describe a data type that in Python isn't even really a line of code. It's, it's just kind of an expression in Python. That's how simple these, what had been the state of the art of sophistication has been over the past 30 years, streamlined and simplified and simplified and streamlined down to something that is just, you know, dictionary that maps string to string. That That's really all we meant by this. We we had this uh, primitive language with primitive data types, and and, uh, and we had to express things in very wordy ways that are not really very interesting. And for those of you who are uh, not as old as I am, uh, that O5 places used Comp3. Comp3 was binary coded decimal numbers two digits per byte two did two wait two decimal digits jammed into each byte i'll repeat that for those of you who have been surfing the web two decimal digits jammed into each byte what nightmare data structure comp3 it's a nightmare data structure it's a horrible thing but but super efficient on the ibm 370 150 hardware oh so that my 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 thesis here is I'm I'm not kidding about how weird this is that you basically have Python arrays from the array module, named tuples, strings, and uh, the decimal type from the decimal module, which um, they know as Comp three, um, and that's all you've got for data structures. No list, no dict, no set, no class definitions. As a pragmatic thing, you didn't really have functions. The COBOL language had them, but um, for the years that I worked in what were at the time big IT shops with mainframes and COBOL, we didn't write our own functions except that at one of the many joints I worked at. Um, it was considered um, somehow difficult to manage um, a, a library of functions. Um, I'm not sure why, but there's, like I said, it's only one place that attempted it. They did a good job of it, but but it was a rarity. So what happens is that you've got very few data structures. You've got tiny programs on old computers or tiny programs designed for old computers. And you've got these other compounding uh, obscurities. COBOL is a go-to statement and it, you basically have to use it because it um, the, the nested uh, perform, which is equivalent of a while in the if statements had weird syntactic limitations. So you had to use go-tos. And a go-to can make an algorithm utterly opaque, or sometimes it can make it quite clear. It's difficult to be sure um, what it's going to do. You have to actually look at the code for a while, and, and sometimes the go-to doesn't seem to be a, a, a cause a lot of harm. There's a thing called a redefines clause. This is the bane of my existence. I have an open source project that will process COBOL records in Python. It reads the COBOL data definite data definition statements. It can work with MCDIC data. Um, it, it's pretty old school stuff, but but redefines means that I have some string of bytes in the record, and the string of bytes has two potentially very different interpretations. I have a, a B with one data type that redefines A. 
A has a different data type. And it's a free union. There's no way to tell which of the redefines applies at any given time. Um, it's a hellscape of wondering what these bytes could mean. Um, and finally, and these, this is rarely used, but there's an alter statement which changed the targets of a go-to. Uh, for the most part, that was considered a bad idea even back in the day. So we tried to avoid using it and, and uh, to an extent we're successful in not using the alter statement. Thank God. Uh, otherwise, woof. So confronted with COBOL code, how hard is it really to fix the problem? And the answer is, could I map the COBOL to Python? Theoretically, yes, but the problem is that the COBOL code implements uh, technically a, a Turing finite state automata. Um, uh, that same finite state automaton might not have the same kind of code in Python that it had in COBOL. And yes, you could automate the translation, but what you will get out of it is obscurely useless Python code. It may behave the same way the COBOL did, but the captured knowledge, the semantics underlying the COBOL would be gone. And so the automated mapping is something that I would strongly discourage anybody from even thinking about doing. Um, you really have to read the COBOL code. And you have to understand that the COBOL code has these obscure data structures that are really optimizations, that the point was to make the maximum use of the megabyte of memory you had. So you read a small file into a table and you use that sort of dictionary-like data structure that's really a complicated COBOL record thing in memory. But what you wind up doing as a COBOL developer is writing some COBOL code that in effect is behaving like a dictionary without providing a fully general dictionary implementation. You're just doing the minimum to get this program to work. And, uh, you know, <laughs> each time this was done, it was a, a repeat of throw people at it rather than write a, a single reusable library to, to cache temporary results in several different programs. Same temp table you know, temporary small lookup table that had, you know, certain kinds of transaction codes in it that you needed to translate all the time. Um, every different program would do a slightly different way of loading that translation table into memory and using it. It was just awful. But that, that you know, schedule mattered. Quality in the long run didn't matter. Um, and so you just threw people at it and people all wrote their own unique versions of algorithms and it was awful. And it, a cache is not, that complicated. But if you have like an LRU cache where things are going to age out because they're not needed any longer, oh my God, everybody would implement that differently and half of them wouldn't work right most of the time. Uh, you'd have memory leaks, you'd have other problems. It would be terrible, just terrible. And that's because there wasn't a rich set of underlying data structures. So, the real problem, beside the obscurity of the code and the primitiveness of the language, is this overall architecture problem. Where do you put the special cases and exceptions? And the answer is either everywhere or anywhere. The answers are isomorphic. People would put optimizations anywhere, just anywhere. So I've got a theoretically idealized, read a bunch of records to edit them, and the valid ones go on to an update program, and the update program goes on to a report program. And somebody comes in on Thursday and says, oh, that customer didn't really order this, they ordered that. Rather than fix the batch of transactions, can you just throw an if statement into the edit to change that customer's order? I would love to do that, but the edit already ran today. So I either have to do it in the update program. Oh, but that runs tonight at 11 o'clock and there's not a lot of time to test it. But the report program is going to run tomorrow. I will fix it in the report program because that's convenient and stupid. 
And that if statement is in that report program until the end of time, that this order number has this transformation to apply to it. Okay. The other one a, a example of this is I, this was one of the ones that sent me around the bend um, uh, causing um, just endless grief over the, the last few decades. Um, I'm, I'm in a, I'm doing data warehouse consulting. I'm at a place that's a COBOL shop. The guy has stuck to his terminal. You, you don't remember these days, but they were, you know, we had IBM uh, PCs that were tall tower-like things with big TV picture tubes, not these modern flat screen laptop things that you kids all have everywhere nowadays. So he's got this giant workstation, giant TV picture tube, post-it notes down the side of the picture tube. We're laughing about the one of those post-it notes has a password on it. It does. But the other post-it note that was there, one of them was a reminder. In February of 1996, change the date calculation to add one. They did not have the leap year calculation correct in one of the apps. They couldn't find the if statement that was broken. So they modified the program every four years to add one to one of the aging payment calculations every four years, post-it note on the side of the workstation. This was acceptable behavior in the COBOL shop. So COBOL isn't bad, capital B, bad. It's lots of little programs, sort of a lollipop architecture. There's nothing wrong with lots of little programs, but, but lots of little programs can exacerbate bad decision-making. And that's where the trouble begins. We are overwhelmed with details. There are lots of redundant special cases. And because we changed one, but not the other, we have code rot, guaranteed code rot, and we wind up with latent bugs everywhere. And, and so this is the problem that COBOL itself isn't bad. It's managing the COBOL environment with an eye toward diminishing code rod or paying down technical debt. That's difficult to do. People are not paid to do good engineering on COBOL. They're paid to keep the lights on. Uh, and I think that's an unfortunate problem and leads us to sort of where we are today, where we're wondering, what can we do? Um, unless you are a mainframe consultant kind of person like you used to be, then you don't generally get deeply involved with this. You're sort of tangentially involved in it. I've got this data file that came out of COBOL world and uh, you know, I'd like to do something better with it, but what can I do to get closer to the source data on the original mainframe and away from some manual transformations that may have happened? The most important thing is, of course, always the data. When dealing with COBOL code, the data has to be preserved. That's the real secret about this. Processing is secondary. It's not unimportant because of the redefines clause. In some cases, it's essential to understand the processing before you can even understand the data, which is weird, but true. Um, one of the things that you can do when confronted with COBOL applications is consider capturing the files and working out the processing scenarios. COBOL apps are not complicated. The processing scenarios are not complicated and you can spell them out in Gherkin. You can, in general, write ATDD kind of acceptance tests in Gherkin for mainframe apps. It's not that hard to do. Um, the problem is that what you discover is because of the COBOL redefines clauses that some parts of the data are going to be a truly unholy mess. And this is where everybody panics and doesn't know what to do. Um, places that tried automated migration of COBOL to Java basically had to bail on it uh, in a lot of times because you can't really automate that very well. The, the languages are too different and the COBOL data is too weird. Um, uh, an automated migration in Python would have the, the same problem, but a manual migration using Python might not have as many problems because you can deal a little more gracefully with irregular data and the presence of redefines clauses to, to handle the bytes. Um, 
you do have to understand the COBOL code to interpret the data, and that's a, a sad but true and uh, frustrating thing, that you have to have the code available in order to make sense of the data. The um, Just, you know, um, it's also true that you wind up with um, the COBOL data definitions don't actually match the files because, you know, the records and the files may date from 30 years ago, but the code may only date from 25 years ago. So there may be records out there that predate the code that's running now. That's a weird but true thing. And yeah, the records have errors and have always had errors. And the program's got enough if statements that it gracefully skips over the errors. And it's really sad, but but that's the way it is. It makes it difficult to preserve the data. So what has to happen is you basically wind up having to look at COBOL source a lot. It's not hard to read, but, and generally the big picture of all mainframe world is somewhere under the hood in that mainframe is really, truly a directed acyclic graph of processing. The whole thing can be restated as a, as a, um, uh, an Apache airflow, uh, a set of processes. It's just that the individual components of that big Apache Airflow DAG are kind of kind of hard to reason out. But the the big picture is that the the mainframe systems are just a DAG. They're just kind of a hideous DAG in a bad language, um, um, you know. So you have to like write a little JCL parser and and you know do some analytics on the COBOL code to kind of work out what that that directed acyclic graph is, but it, it's not that bad. And then you can work out the processing thread that leads you to the specific updates for the files you care about. You can kind of reason backwards, you know, sort of upwards through the, the uh, directed graph, trying to find out what's going on. And, um, you know, you have redefines clauses, there's problems with the data. So, you know, it, it, it it's difficult, but it's far from impossible. And it just requires a exhaustive survey of all the code and all the JCL, which itself is a huge pain in the neck. So you can spend weeks just sort of getting organized to figure out what the data files mean, you know, but um, that as far as I'm concerned is uh, the path forward. Um, dig into the code. It's bad, but, and it's been badly managed, but, you can discover enterprise knowledge hidden down inside that that morass of COBOL. Uh, and the data is, is often valuable because we often l live and die uh, doing data science things, uh, live and die uh, by mainframe extracts where we get the file out of some app that got it out of some app that got out of the mainframe, put it in CSV format so we can load up a pandas data frame and do stuff with it. Um, that transformation did happen. That knowledge is kind of available. Uh, it, it's not unreasonable to look more deeply into the COBOL code and, and take a step further and then eliminate the COBOL from the picture also and just do all the processing in a civilized modern language, carefully preserving that institutional knowledge that the COBOL originally captured. And with that, I am going to switch back out of, share my desktop mode if I'm lucky here, this ought to work. And then uh, I can take uh, questions, if any. Oh okay, my God, cool. the chat channel looks like it's full of questions. Yeah, I think there's, there's some, I think it's um, some questions and, and mostly statements at this point. Um, if you have a, a question for Stephen, would you mind uh, typing it into the chat on the side? Um, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, if you want to um, ask your question in YouTube chat, I will read it off to Stephen. Um, we'll take uh, just a couple of questions live on the stream and then um, we will uh, end the stream, and uh, we will um, then take some more questions off stream. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. Will you be able to share the slides, please? Uh, yes, I will uh, figure out where to um, post the slides. I'll work with Colin on that. Um, they'll wind up somewhere. I'm not sure where right now, but uh, yes, they're, they're, they're certainly postable. Yes, we'll definitely put them on the meetup.
Yeah, good idea. And they wind, may wind up as a, a PDF or something, um, just because Keynote is sometimes gargantuan in the way it saves files, and I don't understand it, but yes, we'll work something out. So Franklin Chen's got a question. Franklin, if you want to unmute and turn on your video to ask it, or or Stephen can um, just take it. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question. So thank yeah, you. I'm old enough to actually have learned COBOL in high school. Um, but there was a big deal made of structured programming. Um, <laughs> so did the COBOL code, any of the COBOL code you worked with use those kinds of techniques, or did they just predate it and never got touched, never got fixed? No, we structured programming was a was a big thing. That um, the it dates from before you were in high school. That's for sure, because um, we were doing the whole structured programming thing back in the seventies and eighties. Um, uh, so yes, it was a thing, but you wound up with um, these peculiar situations where um, you would wind up with deeply nested if statements, and you could no longer nest them because you didn't have the right number of else's to go with the thens or some other kind of stupid syntactic thing. So you'd have to if perform another paragraph. And that kind of thing broke up the obvious nesting of the if statements so that I'd have some paragraph of code here that performed another paragraph of code that was just sort of more of the if statement. And that was frustrating. They were well bounded, but um, they were still hard to read. Yeah. So yeah, structured programming was a big deal, and not everybody did it. I, I worked at one joint um, that had um, some code that had alter statements and stuff in it. It was really abysmally bad, and they their programmers. I mean, the shop was small, you know, seriously less than than twenty people, um, and they really had a lot of trouble with um, the structured programming thing. And they were amazed that I could uh, do the amazing things I could do because I understood if then else. Yeah. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Our next question is from Tao. Tao, would you like to unmute and ask? You're still muted. I was wondering whether we should all learn COBOL. It sounds easy <laughs> to understand, but hard to grab the bugs layered over and over each other, like like translating Perl to shell scripts. <laughs> um, yeah, there there is a certain amount of that. That that it is. It can be hard to figure out what's going on. And when you're writing like fresh new COBOL, you you know most of us have a, a pretty disciplined approach because we've worked with modern programming languages. Um, but when you are confronted with legacy COBOL code, oh my God, you just want to slap those children. Who let you play with matches? You burned your own house down. It's terrible uh, what you have done with this horrible code. But, you know, so it, it's frustrating when you're doing COBOL maintenance and COBOL conversions because the, the stuff is can be pretty bad. Um, but if you were doing it fresh or if, uh, which I can't imagine why you would do fresh COBOL programming nowadays. There are so many better languages, and, uh, but you know, uh, so that that's the frustrating part about it is you, you, you learn COBOL. It's not that bad. You look at code and you say, how, how could have people done such a, a bad job of this? Right. It's also possible to write nice, clean, easy to read Perl code. However, <laughs> <laughs> it may be. I've never seen that either. Um, so I, I maybe have been struggling with the wrong group of people writing bad uh, pi uh, COBOL and, and bad Perl. Um, uh, let's see. I'm looking at the questions now that I got the chat open finally. <laughs> yeah, we've got time for a, a couple more questions. Yeah, the, one of the notes here that C has free unions, um, it is exactly the problem, the C free union problem is exactly the, the COBOL free union problem. I got a bunch of bytes and I don't know how to interpret them, and it is just a terrible mistake. Um, and uh, so what 
um, I was working with some folks who had a Cobalt to Java translator thing. And what they did is they basically exploded the Cobalt data into each one of the redefines alternatives, some of which would wind up being invalid. We couldn't figure out how to make Java objects out of it. So it would just be a whole bunch of null pointers. And other ones would work OK. And that way, you could kind of look through the Java object and figure out which one wasn't a bunch of null pointers. And that must have been the right one. But that's not always true because you can wind up with multiple of the redefines branches having valid data in them, especially with what they call usage display data. And so it is it is utterly ambiguous and you really need to have the code. And so I sort of tried to talk them out of it, but they'd already spent a lot of time and effort writing the library and, and um, thought they had a way to somehow or other make sense of the data. But through lots and lots of validation and internal checking and saying, well, if, you know, this thing that's a bunch of digits doesn't look like a zip code, then it must have been the other variant in the redefines clause. I thought that was kind of childish, but they were happy with it. I've, I've got a question. What would you say has been um, like the most difficult thing to do in COBOL that was super trivial in everything you've used since? Oh, seriously, that's the reason why I call the dictionary example out in Python, because a Python caching dictionary thing is so trivial in Python, it's at LRU cache. It's a damn... Um, decorator for a function. You don't even have to think about it. You just put the at LRU in front of your function and you're done with it. And so that is the most trivial thing is the LRU caching thing that's available in Python. And in all the other languages that have associative stores, a caching kind of algorithm is, is sort of a nothing. Uh, but COBOL, without an associative store, you had to build the associative store yourself the hard way uh, each time. Um, as a show off one time, I did a... Uh, a binary tree uh, algorithm in COBOL. Um, it was one of these things that they had um, a master file of all of the operations performed on all the machines in uh, the actual factory, right? So the file was gigantic and it was essentially the backbone of billing because every operation on a machine cost somebody money and you, you would digest that all the time. The question is, what is the actual distribution of the operations? Some operations are common. You do them all the time, a couple times a day. Other operations are really rare. You hardly ever do them. And so what is the distribution? So you want to select count star group by operation, right? In SQL, you can describe this in a single select statement. You hardly even break a sweat. You're pretty sure when you write that select statement, it works. It's not not like rocket science. In Python, it's a counter object. I just want a counter based on the operation type. It's it's an expression. It's not even a whole line of code. And I have to just read the file. That's it. So in um, COBOL, I wrote a binary tree algorithm that would insert these things into the, the tree, and then it would um, walk the tree um, in order uh, to produce the keys and the counts. And then you you could run it through utility sort to get the counts in descending order. So apparently this thing used to read the master file and sort it and then read the master file and filter it and digest it and do some other stuff in the old, before I wrote the binary tree thing. It ran for a half an hour and you had to run it a couple times a year and they, they kind of hated it because it was a half hour of lost CPU time while you did this summarizing thing. And so I rewrote it and it ran in a minute and they were sort of shocked and would run it over and over and over again every week because they were like, holy crap, how can this run? in only a minute. Well, um, uh, anybody here have an undergraduate degree in computer science? And the answer was no, nobody did. So it was very difficult to explain the magic of tree. Neat. All right. Uh, Kate, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Uh, first, thank you for this uh, presentation. It was really interesting. My question was about what lessons can we learn from frustrating COBOL of the past? So while we're writing things for an unknown future. The big takeaway, the big takeaway for me over the past 30 or 40 years has been um, that keep the lights on management, doing the minimum to keep stuff running 
is a terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, that anything that is preserve the status quo kind of thinking really increases technical debt, and in some cases increases technical debt dramatically. Um, the expiration of Python 2, January of this year, means that every organization with a relatively mature data science community probably has Python 2-based data science code that they got to figure out what to do with. And a bad management policy is it's not technically broken. There's no CVEs for Python 2 yet. So let's just keep going. A better management policy is we should have fixed this before January of 2020, and we better by God fix it now. Because as of PyCon, which didn't happen this year, the 2.7.18 release of Python 2.7 is the archive. There is no more, and there will be no more. We should have been ahead of that fixing it, and that's the better position to take. We should have been ahead of it fixing it. If you depend on open source, open source moves fast. And your app, whatever your app is, sits on a layer of abstraction, the open source tools and languages and whatnot you're sitting on. So I've got an app which is sitting on top of Pandas. Pandas is sitting on top of the Python library. The Python library is sitting on top of the Python runtime. The Python runtime is sitting on top of C libraries. I, my app is on the back of a turtle that is flying through space. This is the whole flat earth theory that the, the universe is just riding on the back of a turtle. The turtle is flying through space. Um, get the Discworld books by Terry Pratchett. He explains the whole thing. So my app is sitting on the back of a turtle flying through space. That turtle is actually standing in the back of another turtle. Pandas is on top of the Python standard library. That turtle is standing on the back of another turtle, the underlying Python runtime. And that turtle is standing on the C libraries. That turtle is standing on the GCC compiler and the other supporting infrastructure. And that turtle is still standing on top of some Microsoft emulation package that's making my, you know, 8086 chip behave like an 8986 chip or whatever the heck is going on down there at that lower level. It's a whole stack of turtles all the way down, each abstraction on top of other abstractions. And they're all moving at the speed of light in different directions. So in the open source using world of Python, we should respect that and keep up to date with all the changes as quickly as we can and avoid the COBOL keep the lights on mentality. Cool. I think we have time for one more question. I think we already hit Max's question in, in, during Kate's question. C is useful for a lot of stuff, operating systems. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I don't want to say uh, C is, is particularly bad, although the Rust people are saying that C's time is over and Rust is taking over. I'm sure it is. All right. With uh, with it seems with no other with no other questions um, in the chat, we will uh, stop the stream and see if anybody's been um, waiting till off stream to ask their questions. <laughs> um, so uh, with that, thank you all very much for um, participating in our in our stream tonight. Um, we're um, super happy to have Stephen. Um, he is uh, a fantastic presenter. One of one of my favorites. And um, I'm super stoked to have been able to to host him here on on Code and Supply.